If you're visiting with us, we're glad to have you. We're in Revelation chapter 14, and we left off last time at about verse 10, where we were looking at the imagery that is used here of God's judgment of the enemies of God's people. And the uh, imagery is in verse 10 of drinking of the wine of the wrath of God mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger. And I uh, can't remember if we looked at these Old Testament passages or not, but we'll look at them briefly again uh, just in case. But uh, John is, as uh, usual, drawing on some Old Testament imagery here of God's destructive power. And in Jeremiah 25, this says, The Lord, the God of Israel, uh, take this cup of wine of wrath from my hand and cause all the nations to whom I send you to drink it. They will drink and stagger and go mad because of the sword that I will send among them. Very common in the prophets to get that mixed imagery, drinking the wine, having the sword come. It's uh, two images of the same thing, of a judgment that God is going to bring upon them. Psalm 60, you've made your people experience hardship. You've given us wine to drink that makes us stagger. And so this uh, kind of uh, throwing them for a loop, uh, knocking them out of their senses, making them uh, unable to uh, go on is the idea. Psalm 75, a cup is in the hand of the Lord and the wine foams. It is well mixed and he pours out of this. Surely all the wicked of the earth must drain and drink down its dregs. And so this idea of being filled up with the wrath of God and him pouring his wrath out completely, as we noted, is even emphasized more in Revelation 14.10 that this wine of the wrath of God is mixed in full strength. It is unmixed. It is undiluted. And so they will uh, face the wrath of God uh, completely uh, without any kind of relenting on God's part. We saw in the earlier part of the book that God does give the wicked an opportunity to repent. He gives them hardship, tries to get their attention, but ultimately this enemy will not listen to God. And so we've seen back in chapter 9, I think it was, that the time for repentance had ended. Here we have that same kind of picture that God is not going to give them any more chances. They're going to taste God's wrath in full strength. Uh, in Isaiah 51, rouse yourself, rouse yourself, arise, O Jerusalem. You have drunk from the Lord's hand the cup of his anger, the chalice of reeling you have drained to the dregs. Therefore, please hear this, you afflicted who are drunk, but not with wine. Thus says your Lord, the Lord, even your God who contends for his people. Behold, I have taken out of your hand the cup of reeling, the chalice of my anger. You will never drink it again. I will put into to the hand of your tormentors who have said to you, lie down, that we may walk over you. So God had given the cup of his wine to Israel, then he is not going to give it to their enemies. And in Isaiah 63, I trod down the peoples in my anger and made them drunk in my wrath. Both of those grape images, we're going to see this idea of trotting down later on in Revelation 14 here as the treading of the wine press. And so whether it is the crushing of the grapes or whether it is the, the becoming drunk, filled up completely, as it were, with the wrath of God, uh, both of those images are used together in Isaiah 63. Uh, the interesting usage of the uh, imagery, however, goes back to what we saw concerning the image here in verse 8 of this great enemy of God's people that is here called Babylon. She has made all the nations drink of the wine of the passion of her immorality. And so there is a subtle contrast being set up in the text here between the intoxication of the harlot's wine. All the nations have become drunk with her wine on her power and her wealth and those kinds of things versus the wine that God is going to give her to drink that will result or that will be a symbol of judgment. And uh, this is actually not too uncommon uh, in the Bible uh, that God works with this kind of irony, that uh, the very thing that is characteristic of a person, God will use that in an excessive way uh, to bring about destruction. Uh, I can think of two examples in the book of Exodus. One would have been the, the plague of frogs, 
Uh, normally in ancient Egypt, to hear the sound of frogs in the springtime was a good thing. It meant that the Nile was rising, the crops were going to be planted, and the land was going to be fertile, and there was going to be food for another year. God says, you like the sound of frogs? I'll give you frogs. And he inundated the land with frogs until they couldn't stand it. And then uh, Israel, as they are wandering through the wilderness, you'll recall in the book of Numbers, um, they come uh, up through uh, the area where that is near Baal Peor, and uh, they said one more time, would that we were back in Egypt. God says, you want Egypt, I'll give you Egypt, and he sends the fiery serpents among them. Snakes, of course, were common in Egypt as well. And so here we have this kind of thing that this great harlot, this Babylon, has been passing out the wine of her immorality and her luxury and her passion to the nations freely and intoxicating them. God says, you want wine? This can be arranged. He's going to have her drink the wine of his wrath. It says there in verse 10 also that uh, when this is accomplished, that um, whoever uh, has joined in this will also be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Of course, fire and brimstone uh, does a couple things for us. It makes us think about the final judgment of the enemy in chapters 19 and 20, or perhaps we should say not the final, but the more detailed description that uh, awaits us there. But it also makes us think, of course, about Sodom and Gomorrah, the two typical sinful cities that were destroyed with fire and brimstone. And it is not without uh, accident that that image comes up here. Uh, Sodom and Gomorrah were, of course, known for their sexual wickedness. And Rome is being here portrayed as a passionate woman who has intoxicated and seduced all the nations of the earth. So this harlot-type image is in the background. We're going to see it in chapter 17 in its fullest description, but it is making an appearance here. And so f like uh, one who is engaged in sexual immorality, anyone who is uh, joined themselves with this enemy, with this great harlot, will suffer that kind of destruction, the kind of destruction that God brings upon sexually wicked people like fire and brimstone. And it says in verse 10 that they will be tormented in the presence of the angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Uh, that is not insignificant. The conqueror will witness the defeat of his enemies before him, and it will be a public universal vindication of who was right and who was wrong. And if you listen very carefully to this text, you might even hear an echo of a very familiar passage, Psalm 110 in verse 1, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies the footstool of your feet. And that is that they will be made to come and be conquered before you, that it, there will be a public display of you over them. And that's what we get here as well, that they will be punished for their rebellion, their unfaithfulness uh, in the presence of the Lamb and his holy angels. <laughs> now, somebody might be thinking, well, how can that happen if these people are eventually going to hell and Jesus and his people are going to be in heaven? Uh, how can they, they be in the presence of the Lamb and still be punished with fire and brimstone? Well, again, it's figurative language. John is not describing the, the literal sequence of events of a judgment here. His point is that it's going to be clear who was right and who was wrong. And the lamb that was persecuted and killed and rejected by this sinful world will be seen in the end to be the one who was right. And all of those enemies of God and of God's people will know in a public way that the Lamb was righteous and they were wrong. And so we shouldn't perhaps make it literal. Uh, I don't think John is trying to describe a literal scene here. 
but a point about righteousness, justice, vindication, and proof of God's power. Uh, and so with that in mind then, in verse 11, the smoke of their torment uh, goes up forever. And again, John is using some Old Testament language here, Psalm 74, 1. O oh God, why have you rejected us forever? Why does your anger smoke against the sheep of your pasture? So this idea of God's anger being like a fire that consumes, in keeping with the brimstone and fire imagery here, that it is on fire, it burns, and it burns, and it burns, and it doesn't stop. Uh, the smoke goes up forever and ever. In Isaiah 34.10, speaking here of God's righteous indignation, it will not be quenched night or day. Its smoke will go up forever from generation to generation. It will be desolate. None will pass through it forever and ever. And so you hear this language God speaking about the enemies of his people in the Old Testament. Uh, here it is applied to this enemy. And so uh, this is probably a, a scene that we probably don't need you know, a whole lot of help picturing, but the idea is something that is being destroyed and burned. And this great column of smoke going up. Uh, you recall in the Old Testament that the Bible says that when Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed, that the smoke went up from it like the smoke of a great furnace. You could see it for miles. It was dark and thick and black and a monument, as it were, of their wickedness in God's judgment. And so here it is that the ascent of the smoke testifies to the judgment of God and becomes a monument of God's justice as well. Uh, it goes up forever and ever, uh, and so this, again, further evokes that Sodom and Gomorrah imagery. And John says that they have no rest day and night, those who worship the beast, his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. Uh, this is uh, in consonant, uh, consonant with what Jesus talked about of uh, hell in the Gospels. We see this in chapter 20 in that final description of the judgment of the enemy. Uh, Isaiah 34, the passage we just looked at, uh, that this is not an annihilation but an eternal punishment that God wreaks upon these enemies, which is, of course, sharply contrasted with the eternal praise of God's own people. Now, the point of all of this is not just to give encouragement to the faithful. It's also to give a warning to those that might be afraid, to those that might be tempted to deny their faith or to compromise. Verse 12, here is the perseverance of the saints who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. John's point is that if you want to avoid this, if you don't want to be part of this horrible destruction that I've just described, then you had better be faithful to the Lamb. Because remember how this started in verse 9, if anyone worships the beast in his image, anyone, whether you are an unbeliever or a believer, if you're going to compromise, if you're going to deny your faith, if you're going to deny that Jesus is your Lord and just to save your neck, well, then you're going to suffer the punishment of those people as well. And so here is the perseverance. It's kind of John's way of saying, I want you to look at this. I want you to notice what goes on here. Recognize what is evil and avoid it. Uh, this is the perseverance of the saints who keep the commandments and their faith in Jesus. Of course, that's what the book is, in a sense, all about. Jesus is writing to these people who are about to go through this severe testing. And Jesus is telling them, listen, it's going to be okay. If you'll be faithful and loyal and don't give in, then you're going to be the winner. And when the smoke clears, your enemy is going to be gone and you'll be in heaven praising God in a glorious scene. And so don't give up. But you're going to have to trust me, Jesus says. 
because it's going to seem like things have gone wrong. It's going to seem at times like you can't bear it any longer. It's going to seem as if the pressure is too great and you're going to feel pressured to compromise, but you're going to have to keep the faith. You're going to have to trust me. And that's what John is getting at here, that they keep their faith in Jesus. Jesus said that if I will be faithful, it'll be okay. That's what I'm going to have to do and not to take my salvation or my, my life into my own hands. Uh, all right then, uh, let's press on. Uh, verse 13, And I heard a voice from he- heaven saying, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, so that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow with them. We haven't been uh, noticing it too much, but there are seven of these beatitudes in the book of Revelation. Blessed is so and so. And here we have one of encouragement because the Lord has just said, now you're going to have to persevere. Don't compromise with the beast or or have any of this uh, uh, stuff about you. You're going to have to say no and be faithful. And yes, it might cost you your life. But that can be even a good thing. Uh, to die in the Lord, to die and to give your life as a sacrifice for the sake of faithfulness, uh, that's a good thing. That is the ultimate loyalty, the ultimate demonstration of faithfulness. And the, the promise is that they may rest from their labors for their deeds follow with them. God is not going to forget the courage and the faithfulness that they have shown. And in a little while, uh, it will, their suffering will be over and they will be in a better situation than they were on this earth. Uh, reminded there of what the author says in uh, Hebrews chapter 10, I believe it is, that God is not so unjust as to forget your good works. Same kind of thing here, that uh, their deeds follow with them. God remembers their faithfulness. Uh, they die, of course, and the Lord is faithful. They rest which is, of course, Sabbath imagery that they, they go to be with God, uh, contrasted to the, the no rest of the condemned in verse 11. They have no rest day and night, but the faithful rest with God. Uh, in Isaiah 57, uh, we get, For the righteous man is taken away from evil. He enters into peace. They rest in their beds, each one who walked in his upright way. And so in a typical fashion for the Old Testament, uh, this physical image is used to describe the results of righteousness. And of course, their deeds follow with them. I think we all realize that New Testament language about reward is figurative. Uh, Literally, a reward is something that you get for having done good but we understand that that's just a a way of talking about salvation, that nobody earns their salvation anyway, so reward is just a figure of speech. Uh, But they rest from their labors, their deeds follow with them. We saw back in chapter 6 and verse 11, when we saw the great multitude, that they were clothed in white robes. And John said, what are these? And the answer was given that they are the righteous deeds of the saints. And so... Uh, their behavior, their faithfulness, their obedience unto death is remembered and goes with them, as it were, before God. All right, then, uh, let's look starting in verse 14. Uh, those of you that have been anticipating the, the violent destruction of the enemy, this is one of the best passages in the book, if you like this kind of thing. Uh, then I looked, and behold a white cloud, and sitting on the cloud uh, was one like a son of man, having a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. And so the enemy is going to be judged like a crop that is ready to be harvested. Harvesting, of course, is a kind of destruction. You cut it down. It doesn't grow. It doesn't live anymore. You kill the crop to harvest it. And so the Son of Man is here now going to harvest. He's going to cut down and destroy this great enemy. A couple of things here are uh, pertinent. The first uh, first thing we see in this verse is a white cloud. 
And that is a clue that judgment is about to happen. Uh, in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7, the Lord introduced himself that uh, we saw that he comes on the clouds. And we suggested that that is not a reference to the final judgment at the end of the world, but his coming to judge this enemy. Uh, the image is taken from Daniel 7 and verse 13, the vision that Daniel has there of the Son of Man and the Ancient of Days coming on the clouds of the sky as a display of divine authority. Jesus uses the same language in Matthew 24, that the Son of Man will come on the clouds in his judgment against Jerusalem. And so here he is coming, riding a cloud to come and judge this enemy as well. It is a typical way of describing God coming to destroy a nation. Uh, Jesus, the Son of Man, here wears a golden crown, and uh, that, of course, indicates, the crown indicates royalty. In Psalm 21, O Lord, in your strength the king will be glad in your salvation. How greatly he will rejoice for you. Meet him with the blessings of good things. You set a crown of fine gold on his head. And so the Son of Man here, this divine figure from Daniel 7, is decked out in the strength and the power of God himself to reign over his enemies. And there is again an echo of Psalm 2, that the Lord has appointed his righteous one, that you are my son today, I've begotten you, I've appointed you as a ruler over the nations, and so forth. And, of course, uh, as we've noted, he holds in his hand a sickle, a sharp sickle. Here, the idea of cutting the enemy down. Uh, these are some of uh, the kinds of things that John perhaps had in mind. These are some grape harvesting sickles uh, from Roman times. And you can see that there would have been a wooden handle where the tang uh, comes here. But uh, they use these for cutting the clusters off of the vines, and that's what we get here as well. So in verse 15, another angel came out of the temple, crying out with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, because the harvest of the earth is ripe. Then he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was reaped. And so we have here the reaping of the earth. And, of course, in the Old Testament, reaping is a time of joy because the crops come in and the good things, but it can also suggest, as we said, a destruction. So perhaps there's both of that here as well. Joy for the people of God that the enemy is being destroyed, but a message of judgment against those who have not obeyed. And the fact that the, uh, the message comes out of the temple, of course, indicates that this is God's will that this enemy be destroyed, divine authority given to the Son to execute this plan, and the earth is then reaped. Uh, this grape harvest imagery again goes back to verse 8, where we have the harlot making the nations drink of the wine of the passion of her immorality, and so this imagery is now being kind of turned upside down that the wine and the grapes are now as a, a symbol of judgment. And of course, treading the wine press is a common Old Testament image, but every time it appears in the Old Testament, it is always a symbol of judgment. So for example, in Joel 3, put in the sickle, the harvest is ripe, Tread for the wine press is full, the vats overflow for their wickedness is great. Like grapes that are ready to be harvested, full of juice, they must be crushed. Uh, Isaiah 63 is perhaps the classic passage of God destroying the Edomites. Who is this who comes from Edom with garments of glowing colors from Bozrah, this one who is majestic in his apparel, marching in the greatness of his strength. It is I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. The question goes, why is your apparel red and your garments like the one who treads in the wine press? The answer comes, I have trodden the wine trough alone. Uh, I trod them in my anger and trampled them in my wrath. Their lifeblood is sprinkled on my garments and I stained all my raiment. For the day of vengeance was in my heart and my year of redemption has come. So remember, the Edomites were a classic enemy of Israel. God destroys them, 
And here that image is used as well. And in Lamentations, even with the destruction of God's own people, the Lord has rejected all my strong men in my midst and called an appointed time against me to crush my young men. The Lord has trodden as in a winepress the virgin daughter of Judah. So the image is used of God's enemies, whether they be his own people or others, but always of this kind of thing. Um, for those of you that uh, studied with us last year about structure in biblical text, there's kind of an interesting one here where you get the same thing now repeated. We had the Son of Man with a sharp sickle, the order given, and then the earth was harvested. Verses 17, 18, and 19 simply repeat that scene. And it has been suggested by one scholar that the double narration emphasizes the severity and unqualified nature of the punishment. In other words, why tell me this twice? So that you get the point, because telling you once is not emphatic enough. But if the Bible tells us twice, it's the Bible's way of kind of underlining it and saying this is really important. And so... We get the same scene, an angel comes out, has a sharp sickle, another angel says, put in your sickle, gather the clusters, the angel swung his sickle to the earth and gathered the clusters. You'll notice in 17, 18, and 19, the action is all done by angels, indicating perhaps that the Son of Man is represented by an angel who actually carries out his destruction. We've looked at this before in other studies in Revelation and in Hebrews as well, that the ancient Jews believe that angels did all kinds of things at God's bidding, good and bad. And so we have that kind of thing here as well, that these angels are sent forth to go out and destroy the enemy. Uh, and so the, the reaping is done. In verse 20, uh, there you see a mosaic of some people uh, treading the wine press, and the wine press was trodden outside the city. Blood came out from the wine press up to the horse's bridles for a distance of 200 miles. Again, that's, that's not literal. There's no place in ancient history where anything near like this happened, where there was a 200-mile pool of blood six feet deep. Uh, but it's simply the idea that their destruction is complete, that every one of them has been crushed, their blood is flowing in this great pool, and there is no doubt about the wrath of God being poured out upon them. Uh, notice outside the city. We saw before in the book that God had measured off the city. And the court of the Gentiles was given to be trodden underfoot by the nations. So God has now judged them, but those who were marked off inside the city, uh, they're kept safe because of their faithfulness. The Lord keeps them. And so here outside the walls is the death and the destruction. Outside the walls are the unbelievers and those who are not within God's kingdom are judged and destroyed and the city, of course, always represents ultimately the people of God. The book of Revelation is dealing with this big picture. It's kind of like, like a snake. Um, you cut a snake in two, and his tail still flips around and squirms for a while, and then just kind of gradually gets still and is there no more? Even though the death blow was given to it, it kind of lingers on. Uh, I kind of think that that's the, the thing we're to understand in the book of Revelation, that, that John is not so much talking about the physical events, look for this, look for that, as we've said before. John is saying, I want to give you the, the picture concerning Rome's power and the spiritual picture behind this, that it's dead, it's destroyed, it is judged, it is cast out by God, it might go on lingering for a while in human history, but as far as it is concerned, it's judged, it's dead, and it's not going to bother anybody. Uh, that's the kind of thing, if that illustration makes sense, that I think we're being told in Revelation. That's one of the things that makes 
our approach kind of hard for some people that, well, you can't put your finger on a time when you could say, well, Rome was no more after this date. But that's not, I think, the, uh, the focus. So it kind of brings to light that, that it is a rise and fall of power behind the scenes, not on the earth that we're looking at here. All right, then, let's see if we can look at a couple uh, verses in chapter 15. Uh, 15 is an interlude, and we've seen these in the book before, that before the final big bang of destruction and judgment is completely unleashed, but there is a pause. We saw that in the first part of the book a couple times. Here we have the uh, s uh, another one, and this is going to be followed by a series of seven bowls of divine wrath unleashed in chapter 16. Uh, so John says in verse 1, I saw another sign. We've heard this language before, chapter 12 and verse 1, a sign appeared in heaven. Then verse 3, then another sign appeared, and here is a third sign. So if you're keeping track of those signs, the first sign was the image of God's people, this woman that God keeps safe. Uh, then there is another sign, the dragon, the enemy, and the third sign resolves the conflict. We have God's people, their enemy, and the third sign that John sees is the victory of God's people. And like we have noted before, John doesn't describe the battle. He doesn't describe too much the, uh, the actual warfare because that's not the important part. The part that's important is to know that the faithful are going to win. And the details about that, it's almost as if we don't need to know that. What you need to know is the outcome. It says in verse 1, I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous. And just about every time you turn around, of course, in the book of Revelation, you're looking at something from the Old Testament, whether you realize it or not. This little phrase, great and wonderful, great and marvelous, is actually a language that's used in the Old Testament to describe plagues of judgment. Uh, sometimes God will say that I'm going to do something that, that'll make your ears tingle. It's another way of saying that, that, that you won't believe what I'm going to do to you. And so to say that this is great and wonderful is not a positive thing. It's you, you won't believe the destruction God is about to unleash here. Uh, it is a great and marvelous sign, seven angels who had seven plagues, which are the last, because in them the wrath of God is finished. In what sense are these the last is it that they are the last time we're going to see this kind of series of judgments? Or I think perhaps the better answer is that in this we're going to see the consummation of God's wrath. Now again, we're looking at the same picture over and over again, just in different imagery, different ways of saying it. We've seen this picture before, but John says, I want to show it to you again. And in characteristic fashion, every time we see it, it's a little bit more intense. And so even though we know by now that, yes, the faithful are going to win and the, uh, the enemy is going to be destroyed, we just saw the image of the, the wine press and uh, the enemy of God being crushed completely in it. It's as if John says, but that, that doesn't do justice to this judgment. I want to tell it to you again so that you really get a sense that this is going to be a final judgment for this wicked nation. So we're going to hear again in chapter 16 about this judgment. But before we hear about it, John again wants to say, but I want you to know that the people of God are the winners. And it's almost as if John doesn't want to make us wait. He's shown us four or five times now in the book this scene of God's people with God, rejoicing, praising God in his presence with the enemy all gone. And then John says, well, here's how it happens. God judges your enemy. But he puts that up front as if to say, this is what I want you to see and know. Get this out of anything else. Um, I think our time is up for this morning. We will pick up uh, then with what John sees starting in verse 2 next time. Thanks again for your good
attention as always.